Hey, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this talk, last talk before lunch. My name is Alexey Kojanov, and I'm going to be talking about deserialization today. A little bit about me, I'm a software developer in the past, and then at some point I realized that breaking code was uh, way more interesting than writing code, and I moved to the security side and have been doing that ever since. But still, deep inside, I think I'm a developer. So today's talk is going to be mostly looking at the code, running it, and seeing what's happening. So those people in the back, I don't know, um, you might want to move a little bit closer. I tried to make the font bigger in my demo. We're going to be talking about what deserialization is, how it's used, why it can be dangerous, and we're going to talk about a few vulnerabilities. So imagine you have a program with uh, some kind of object in this program, in the memory, and that program wants to send that object to, to another process or another program. And the, the way it's usually done, that object is converted to some kind of byte stream, and that byte stream goes over a communication channel, which could be a network or, or even a disk or some kind of API call. And on the other end, that byte stream is converted back to the internal representation of the object in another program. And these two processes are called serialization and, and deserialization. This is a very easy concept. Uh, there are uh, languages and, that uh, support native uh, serialization, and some of them use binary format, for example, Java, or even, even if you just snap a memory that uh, is allocated by a C++ object, you, know, that you can tell that this is a serialized object. Um, and we also have some human-readable formats. For example, XML or JSON. Uh, these are basically text files which you can open and read and understand exactly what's in it. Uh, there are tags and some data between those tags or some other kind of characters that tell you what the data is and, uh, and uh, how you can interpret it. All right, and with that, we move into our, into our lab. And let's take a look at some basic uh, serialization stuff. I hope you can see it okay. I made the font large enough. I... So we have a class called Planet. And this class implements java.io.serializable, which means that this class, the objects of this class could be serialized and deserialized. Planet has order in the solar system, name, nickname, and mass. Um, and not much else. And we have a class called basic serialize, which, is, which just has a, the main method. And, and first thing it does, it creates an instance of, of a planet. And we create a planet for Earth. And it's going to serialize that object and write it to a file called earth.ser. And the way serialization is done in Java is you create object output stream, um, and, uh, and you call its method called write object. And you, feed, you can feed any Java object to it, and it will just serialize it. And since we write in it to a file, we also have our file output stream. And as soon as we write uh, our object to a file, we're going to read from it. And we're going to use our object input stream and deserialize that object by calling the read object method. And this method uh, deserializes the byte stream and returns that just a plain Java object, and we need to cast it to uh, the class that we are dealing with, which is planet. So enough, enough theory, let's, let's run it. I'm com compiling my code. Hope it works. Yeah, so I ran the code, and it told me that object was written to, to earth.ser, and then we read it, and, and uh, we printed that planet uh, right here, okay? If I look at the disk, I have this file. So let's, let's take a look at this file a little closer. First of all, I'm going to use Linux utility called file, which analyzes file and, and tells me what it is. And the, in this case, it tells me this, this is Java serialization data version 5. OK, pretty good. Now, uh, let's take a look at the hex data. 
And I'm going to use a, I think that's the right syntax. Uh, hold on a second, sorry about that. I need to make this window a little smaller so everything fits on the screen. Okay. This is the hex data for that serialized Java object. And the first four bytes read ACED0005. If you see this kind of signature somewhere, you can guess that this is a serialized Java data. That's useful to know. On the right-hand side, the raw data. And even though it's not necessarily text, it's not, it's not really readable, but you can see pieces of information here, like planet, which is our class name, or um, the uh, member names, like nickname, and even the date itself, Earth and Blue Planet. Cool. Uh, let's also try to base64 encode this data. And this is completely unreadable, but the first, the first five characters read R-O-0-A-B. If you see this kind of signature somewhere, like in your burp log, for example, uh, you can guess with high probability that this is serialized Java data. Okay. Uh, and we move in into our second exercise, and we're going to use serialized object for authentication. Uh, let me clean this up a little bit. We have a different class here. It's called user, and it also implements uh, java.io.serializable, which, as we know, uh, this object can be serialized and deserialized. And user has a username and role, and has a little method called isAdmin, which returns true if the role equals administrator. We also have our session manager, our session class. And this class has two constructors. The first constructor accepts username and password and authenticates the user with these credentials. And, uh, it, and then it returns the session cookie based on that. And our session cookie is just serialized user object. And also has a, a second constructor. And this one accepts cookie and performs the opposite thing. It deserializes this cookie gets the user object out of it, and then welcomes the user back, and determines whether the user is administrator. So let's see what happens when we run it. I'm going to pretend that I'm typing this uh, in a web interface. Uh, this is just a unit test command line, right? So before I do that, let me jump back to the code and uh, show you my user database, we have two users, Copernicus, who is a regular user, and Galileo, who is administrator, so two astronomers. Uh, we also have a couple of classes to serialize and deserialize, pretty much the same stuff that we saw before, except this time we deal with base64 data, not just binary stuff. Um, OK. So I'm authenticating as Copernicus first. His password is Poland. And I authenticated successfully and got this session cookie. Now, my browser on the next HTTP request is going to submit the session cookie to the web application um, and, and try to do something. So let's try and see how it, how it works. I submitted my session cookie to the session manager, and it welcomed me, welcomed me back as Copernicus. Great, so let's do the same thing for our administrator, administrative, administrative user. His password is Italy. Here's my session cookie. I'm gonna copy it again and give it back to uh, the application. He wel welcomed me as Galileo and told me that I'm administrator. Makes sense, right? Pretty straightforward. Now, let me let us take a closer look at Copernicus Cookie, who is, who is non-admin, and see what we can do to fix that. I'm going to 
print this cookie, and I'm going to base64 decode it, and write it to a file called cookie.ser. Okay, now we have this file on the disk, and I'm writing a hex editor. And uh, this is similar to what we saw before, right? And uh, if I analyze it a little bit, I, um, I can find this, the string which, which reads regular. So I'm, I'm just gonna go ahead and replace it with administrator and see what happens. So I'm gonna start typing admin is, uh, and I ran out of room here because administrator is obviously longer, so I need to go to insert mode. And since this is a longer string, I also need to fix this byte here, which, in, which, um, uh, which is basically the length of the string. So I'm gonna change it to 0D. Save it, close it. And uh, what I'm gonna do now is I, I have my new cookie in this file, so I'm going to uh, base64 encode it. I need to use this parameter so it doesn't break the string. And I'm gonna feed it to my session manager. So now it welcomed me back as Copernicus, but this time it told me that I'm administrator, right? So I, I was able to modify that serialized data and replace a very critical thing with my own stuff. And the reason I was able to, to do it was because the session manager does not check the integrity of, that, of this cookie. It just accepts it as it's true uh, and inter interprets it and just, just uses it and makes decision based on it. So if my session manager was using a private key to sign this message and, and check it when it receives the cookie, this, would, this could not be possible. Okay. Um, so far so good. And we're moving into our third exercise. This time we're gonna use serialized object and upload it to our application and it should accept it and do something with it. We have our planet object, the same one that we saw in lab number one. And we have upload manager. And this, this is a sim simple program. It, just parses the standard input and it's looking for this little string, RO0AB, which as we know now is a signature for serialized Java data. And as soon as it sees something like this, it's gonna call method called process upload. And this method basically deserializes that stuff and creates planet object out of it, and then we need to do something with this planet. We have not implemented it yet. Like for example, we want to store it in our solar system database. So we let astronomers upload new planets to our wonderful web application. And uh, in order to get some sample data, I, I wrote a little program that generates a few plan several planets, Mercury, Venus, and Earth. It serializes them. Uh, and I also serialize a string. So this is just a simple string object, and the reason I, I do it is I, I just wanna see what, what's happening when my um, backend code is seeing a string, which should not be there. So I, I compiled my, this uh, sample uh, object generator, and I, uh, here are the three planets, and, and a string, a little string here. Now I need to compile my upload manager. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna pipe 
output of my serial generator, with, which, which is basically this whole stuff right here to my upload manager, and it should process all these things one by one. And it did. It told me that Mercury, Venus, and Earth were successfully uploaded, and then it got an exception because it saw a string, which, which is nice, right? Uh, and as long as we handle this ex exception correctly, we should be okay, we will not process the string, and we not fail completely. But I want you to pay attention to the exact error message here, which says, string cannot be cast to planet, which suggests that this method, read object, did actually return. So the object was deserialized. That string was deserialized. The, the, the error, the exception was thrown here when we tried to cast it to planet, because string and planet are not compatible. You cannot cast one to another. Okay, in order to prove my point that serialization ha deserialization happens no matter what, I have more stuff in my sample uh, object generator, some bad stuff here, some, some kind of bad object. So I uncommented this, and I need to recompile my serial generator, and I'm, I'm gonna run the code again, okay? And again, it processed the three planets, it got an exception on the string, right? This is part of it. And then it did not return. And it sits here, not giving me back my command line. And if I look at my task manager, it tells me that this process, the upload manager, consumes 100% of my CPU. Actually, over 100. I don't know how it's possible, but. Um, <laughs> Must be some really bad stuff. Um, and uh, trust me, it's gonna sit he here forever. It's never going to return. So I'm just gonna kill it. So I killed it, I got back my command line. And let's take a look at that object. And here it is. I didn't write it, full disclosure. I, I just got it off a West website. And this object uh, is basically a hash set, which uh, has more, more hash sets, so it's, kind of, it's a kind of, kind of a structure, maybe a tree, so we iterate 100 times and we create new hash sets and assign some, add some data to, it, to them and, uh, and then uh, set the, those links, you know. And this is not a huge object, right? We, we iterate only 100 times, but JVM has a big issue with it. It, it does not like it. When it tries this, to deserialize it and build that graph, it just, it just never finishes. So this is a great way to kill your application to make it uh, use CPU cycles. And the more we submit, the more uh, we submit stuff like that, uh, we can just uh, disable the application. Yeah, so this code consumes CPU indefinitely when deserializing. And deserialized. What about this? This is a very small object. So this one would actually try to allocate eight gigabytes of heap. Sweet. What about this one? It's, a, it's, it's still a pretty small object. So this one will try to allocate 64 gigabytes. Uh, there's just two different methods to do it. So, and you can imagine that stuff like that can kill your application. It will just say, I'm done. I have a few examples of that. If you look up this name online, and I have some links at the end, you'll see uh, more examples. So, so this guy just writes this for fun. So yeah, this is the, uh, the uh, serialized object that will cause my program to allocate 64 gig. If I give it to my upload manager, I don't have 64 gig on this little VM. It, it instantly ran out of space, and it didn't fail gracefully. It just, it just finished. So I killed it. Awesome. 
Um, okay, denial of service. So how can we protect from this kind of stuff? How, how can we prevent this unsafe deserialization? And one way to do it in Java, uh, bear with me for a moment. Uh, I should have, not, should have not closed this, but um, okay. Remember this object input stream? This is the standard class that is used for deserialization. We can extend it, and we're gonna call it safe object input stream, and the only thing that we're gonna do this time is to override one of the classes. This class is called resolve class. Uh, this, uh, sorry, one of the methods. This method is called resolve class. This method is called during deserialization automatically, and um, what we're gonna do here is we get the, the class name from the input that we are deserializing, and we're gonna compare it to the class name of, of the class that, that we expect to see, which is the planet. And if, if one does not equal to the other, we're just gonna throw a custom exception, and we should fail gracefully. Makes sense, right? You know, if this is something that we don't expect, we should just not do it. So I'm gonna uncomment, uh, re basically replace uh, the standard stream with my own. Save. I need to recompile my upload manager. And I'm gonna run it again with that bad object that's gonna, allocate, uh, that's gonna consume my CPU. And this time it did not hang. And it failed with my exception. And it told me that it's on unsupported class, which is java.util.hash set. Excellent. So this will pretty much prevent you from deserializing any, anything other than what you expect. All right. Okay, uh, denial of service is a, is a pretty good, cool thing, and sometimes attackers' goal is to cause just denial of service, but a lot of times they also want to do something else, like I think the ultimate goal uh, pretty much every time is to own your server, and one of the ways to own your server is to run commands in it. So basically remote command execution, and let's see if we can hide some commands in a serialized object. And we have our upload manager again. Uh, the astronomers are going to upload the planets. This time, though, we uh, customized our planet class. It's not that simple anymore. We, we have our own write object and read object methods that serialize and deserialize. And in the read object, the thing that we wanna do is every time we see a planet and we deserialize it, we wanna write a message in our application log and we do a very, very silly thing. Don't try it at home. We, create, we build a command, uh, which is echo command, and we, uh, we basically run it externally in a shell. What can go wrong, right? Um, <laughs> so, this name right here that we include as part of this command is controlled by whoever submits the planet data to us, right? Because we, we get it straight out of the object, of serialized object, and we insert it here. So if an attacker controls it, can they build it in a way that will let them execute arbitrary code on our server machine? And the answer is yes, of course. So I have my serial generator and I have three good planets and one rogue planet here and I'm just gonna uncomment this right away. And Pluto 
what it does, um, instead of, let me make it a little, let me move the window so everything fits. I don't know if I can do it. Hold on a second. Okay, so instead of, the, instead of the name here, so this is the planet name. And it, it's uh, some kind of a string with semicolons. And as we know, semicolons in a shell mean uh, separate one command from another. So one, gets, one command gets terminated, another command gets run. And you can guess, we get code execution. So let's, let's just run it and see. I recompile my things. And I guess I did not save the file. Okay. So this time it just processed three planets. So I need to recompile serial generator again. Okay, this time it processed three planets and it said it processed this funny planet as well with this funny name. But if you Pay attention, okay, I'm gonna run it again. If you pay attention in the upper right corner here, I have a little pop-up that says, you've been owned. And that's basically the result of this notify send command. So this is just a proof of concept. And, and this, again, this is a very, very silly thing to do, um, but things like that, like this do happen. Now let's talk about more sophisticated stuff. Uh, who here attended the talk at 11, uh, at 10.15, I think, on deserialization? Yeah, good. So, Jan was talking about uh, gadget chains. So, the, this, this thing right here, Apache Commons collections issue that was found in 2015, was using these gadget chains in Apache Commons library to execute code. Now, the problem was not in Apache Commons collections at all. I mean, they were not doing anything wrong. The problem was in all these web applications that did not check the serialized input. And if you don't do it and you have a library on your class path and somebody, somebody submits an object with um, a serialized object with some of these gadgets, out of this Apache Commons library, uh, your web application is just gonna process it. And I mean, this is a subject for a whole separate talk and there are, there are talks on, on this particular issue, but in a nutshell, uh, several methods get called during deserialization and ultimately we get runtime and we execute uh, attacker supplied command. Okay, the second one I want to talk about is 2017 Apache Struts REST plugin vulnerability. So this one, uh, here is a screenshot of uh, HTTP request with XML payload, and this XML has some Java stuff in it, and here is the string right here that will run on the server as a result of this. And this, this will open a reverse shell, I believe. A more recent vulnerability in, in CyberArk Password Vault, if you don't know what CyberArk Password Vault is, it's basically your enterprise level password manager for privileged users. Pretty important stuff. They have a REST API that's using authentication token, um, kind of like that session token, more complex though. And this token happens to be a serialized.net object. That, nothing wrong with that. But there was no integrity protection, meaning anybody could modify a token and replace things in it, and uh, this REST API would accept it. But even worse, there was no class type validation, so you could create any arbitrary .NET object, serialize it, and give it to this API, and even though you would not be able to authenticate because it's an invalid object, deserialization would happen, and as a result, you can guess, the, uh, the researchers were able to run remote code, uh, 
run remote code on the system. Uh, so they reported it to the vendor, they fixed it, researchers published, and we all have a very good lesson to learn. Um, I just want to show you real quick how easy it is to exploit remote code execution vulnerabilities. And we're going to use this REST plugin as an example. Okay. Uh, I don't need the editor anymore. Here is the exploit, which is the Python code, and I didn't have to write anything. I just downloaded it. The first thing it needs, it needs a URL. So we need to find a vulnerable application. And there is such an application called Toy Request Form, courtesy of SANS Institute. And this uh, application is used by the kids to request toys from, from Santa for Christmas. Uh, and it happens to be vulnerable to this particular issue. This is intentional. So don't worry. So I'm just giving the URL. Uh, and I need a command. And what I'm going to do is I, I, want, I want a, re, a remote shell. So I have, I have just logged into uh, one of my Linux machines with a public IP address. OK. And I need to copy it because I don't remember it. And I started Netcat Listener on port 1337. And uh, on the vulnerable server, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, run Netcat uh, that will connect to my machine and give me a reverse shell. So I need to specify bin sh and then the address of my system, and the port. OK, it completed successfully. Say so payload executed. If I go back to my machine, I see connection from somewhere. I guess maybe I need to move that too. OK. A connection accepted. What is it, right? Uh, let's see if I can. Yeah, I can list directories in the root. Uh, what is the host name here that I've just got? Here's the host name. Can I look at the processes? Yes, I can. So I'm, I've got a shell on the remote machine, and it took me like, what, two minutes? Very easy, right? And I didn't have to write, to write any code for it. Yeah, well, um, going uh, back to the third party libraries that, uh, like this, that, that could be vulnerable. So you need to know what your application is using, right? Um, those things, you cannot just pick up any random junk from the internet. Um, you need to track those dependencies too, and you know what you're dealing with at any point in time, and monitor their CVEs and stuff, and patch, patch, patch promptly. In the conclusion, serialization is wonderful, but it can be dangerous if not done correctly. You can try to avoid it. And, and that might be a valid solution, but sometimes it's unavoidable or doesn't make any sense. So you need to do it right. You need to, to validate all the input. Because as we have just learned, bad deserialization can result in all kinds of access control bypasses and denial of service and remote, even remote code execution. And again, even when your own code is completely secure, as soon as you use as long as you use the libraries that are insecure, you might be vulnerable as well. And you can go to GitHub and download all the code that I used today, and feel free to play with it and run it. And I also have links on that GitHub page that you could click and read more about deserialization. Thank you very much for coming today.